Have you ever been confronted with a terrible situation for which there was no adequate explanation? You had better brace yourselves because something truly horrifying has just taken place. And the Bible is the only thing that can possibly explain what happened. Come with me as we investigate this terrible tragedy and get to the bottom of what really happened. You won't want to miss out on this opportunity. Chapter Pandemics, Wars, and Rumors Abound According to what's written in the Bible, another horrific catastrophe would rock the world near the end of World War I. A new form of flu began spreading over the world in January 1918. The virus's origin is still unknown. Some historians believe the virus started at a British camp in France, while others believe it originated in North America. Yet, as the virus spread, the severely restricted press on both sides of World War I concealed knowledge of the epidemic for fear of undermining morale. The unrestrained press in neutral Spain was able to publish reports of a terrible sickness that had swept the country, a phenomenon that gave the virus its name, Spanish flu. Because of the reality of World War I, the Spanish flu came at a time when the world was becoming increasingly interconnected. Both sides troops traveling to and from the front lines easily transmitted the sickness to civilians. The Spanish flu thrived in urban areas and quickly spread to the countryside, leaving few locations unaffected by the medieval-style pandemic. Companies and schools were forced to close. Quarantines were put in place. Individuals went about their normal lives wearing face masks. These steps, however, appeared ineffective in halting the disease's flow. An estimated third of the world's population was impacted over the course of 18 months, with as many as 50 million people dying as a result of the virus. While the Spanish flu primarily killed the very young and the very old, individuals of middle age suffered greatly as well. The virus, together with the devastation produced by the Great War, must have appeared like the end of days to many believers. Following World War I, there were both man-made and natural famines all throughout the world, including in Germany, Iran, China, and Russia. From 1914 to 1920, 17 earthquakes struck the world, from Japan and China to Mexico and the United States to Samoa and Australia. As nation against nation rose throughout the Great War, it appeared that Jesus' prophecy had come true. Or did you have it? Nowadays, it appears that we are going through the same thing. Early in 2020, war with Iran appeared unavoidable, and North Korea unrest appeared impending. A swarm of locusts is ravaging East Africa, threatening the crops of an already impoverished region. There have been multiple earthquakes, the most recent of which occurred in California as of this writing. All of these circumstances, together with the coronavirus, appear to point to the fulfillment of Jesus' prophecy. That could be correct. The important term in Jesus' statement, however, is the end is not yet. Battles, plagues, and natural disasters are all tragic realities of a world cursed by sin. These events can occur individually or concurrently, but they are not indicative of the end of the world. Christians, though, must not be complacent about Jesus' return. Whether we live in the end times or not, these occurrences will occur as a foreshadowing of the eschaton. Together with these things would follow great persecution, false prophets, the spread of immorality, and the hardening of many hearts. The end will arrive only after this message of the kingdom shall be spread all over the globe. With this in mind, Christians must be attentive, much like the five virgins in Jesus' parable who prepared for the entrance of the bridegroom. He accomplishes this by serving God and his fellow man, investing in and developing the gifts that God has bestowed upon him. We serve him when we serve the least and show others how to know him. But without knowing the Ancient of Days, one cannot be genuinely prepared to encounter the End of Days. This entails trusting God, believing in the resurrection of His Son, and recognizing Jesus as Lord. Even in the face of disaster and tribulation, the believer has hope in the return of Christ in glory and spending eternity with Him that the unbeliever does not. To be free from the tyranny of sin and death, to be formed in the newness of life, and to be optimistic about the coming resurrection. Why would God let the quake hit Turkey and Syria? Over 46,000 people died in the Turkey-Syria earthquake, which is hard for people in the UK, which is not prone to earthquakes, to understand. Rescue efforts are coming to an end, but some people are still holding out hope that their loved ones will be found at the last minute. For a lot of people, this is just the beginning of a long road of sadness. 
of dealing with a deep loss in just a few short minutes. Villages have been turned into piles of ruins, families were decimated, and landscapes were obliterated as far as the eye can see. There are now children without parents and mothers without children. The tragic death of footballer Christian Atsu is a reminder that every person buried beneath the rubble has a face and a name. An Act of God When a natural disaster happens, it can bring up a lot of questions. If God is real, why do these things happen? Some people say that a God who claims to be good and in charge of the forces of nature can't be good if so many people are suffering for no reason. Other kinds of large-scale disasters are just as easy to watch, like the destruction and trauma caused by wars and conflicts around the world. But at their core, they are not as hard to understand. People can be mean to each other and do horrible things to each other. The fact that it will soon be a year since Russia invaded Ukraine is a stark reminder that people can use their freedom for both good and bad. But catastrophes such as earthquakes are different. People don't seem to cause natural disasters. Instead, they seem to happen in spite of them. Our insurance policies protect us against the acts of God. Is this how you see them? But what sort of God lets an earthquake happen? Surely not one worth pondering? If God has the power to part seas and calm storms, then surely he could stop them from happening, or better still, create a planet without them altogether? Chapter Geology and Geography Geologists would tell us that the Earth's crust is made up of tectonic plates and that the same forces that cause earthquakes are also important for life on Earth. Subduction, which is when one plate slides under another, is important for bringing carbon and other minerals from deep inside the Earth back to the surface. We also can't ignore the fact that the stunningly beautiful mountain ranges that we climb up in the summer and ski down in the winter are also created by plate tectonics. Some people might say, of course, that crushed bodies are a high price to pay for even stunning beauty. Geographers point out, though, that mountains are also an important part of the hydrological cycle because they send water to rivers that bring water to large areas. All of this doesn't help us figure out where God is during a natural disaster, but it does show that asking if there could have been a better world is harder than it might seem at first. Chapter What if we take God away? If God doesn't exist, how can we make sense of natural disasters? If there is no God, then this is just how things are. The universe we live in is a closed system of cause and effect, and the laws of nature acting on matter. When tectonic plates crash into each other, shock waves are sent out, and where a person is at the time is just a matter of chance. Some people are just at the wrong place at the wrong time. Statistically speaking, there are half a million earthquakes every year, and although only 100 are strong enough to cause any damage, chance alone can explain why every so often there will be a big one. The natural world is described by the sciences in a beautiful and clear way, but they don't answer our most important questions about natural disasters. They also don't help us understand why our natural response isn't just to accept the way things are. When bad things happen, we get angry, sad and upset and fight against it. To call something a disaster is to make a moral judgment, to imply that something is wrong with the world and that things could or should be better than they are. How does this morality make the most sense in what kind of universe? Is it a godless universe, where morality is a strange thing to find, or a universe that has always been moral because it was made by a good god? Surprisingly, our sadness, anger, and grief over natural disasters are not signs that we should turn away from God, but that we should turn toward Him. Chapter God With Us Where is God when something bad happens? Who is this God we're talking about? In my new book, Broken Planet, I tell the stories of people who are on the front lines of rescue and humanitarian work. Time and time again, they talk about how God, in the person of Jesus, was with them when they went to be with other people who were in deep pain and tragedy. There are no easy or tidy solutions, but the Christian story is that God connects with the people he made not by telling them how to deal with disasters, but by becoming a part of human history. To be with us and help us through all of our pain and grief, especially if our worst fears come true. The Incarnation is where the idea of helping people in times of trouble and disaster comes from. Jesus came to us, but we can also go to Him if we want to. He is someone to whom we can take our anguish and trauma and does not ask us to ignore it or bury it. Jesus knows what it's like to be sad and hurt, and He suffered just like us 
and for us on a cruel Roman cross so that we can go to him in times of tragedy and find comfort, peace, and real help from him even if we're surrounded by chaos and death. Where is God in a natural disaster? He's in the middle of all the trouble. Chapter, A Future Hope History records that the time of Jesus' death and the time of the stone being rolled away from the tomb three days later were both accompanied by earthquakes. Is this just a coincidence, or is it pointing to the certainty of that first Easter in human history? I'm more likely to agree with the second one, which says that Jesus' death and resurrection were huge events that deserve our attention. If Jesus really did rise from the dead, then natural disasters and the pain they cause are not the ends of the story. The Bible talks about a time in the future when God will make everything new and wipe every tear from our eyes, a time when all the brokenness and disaster we see now will be fixed in ways we can't even imagine or put into words. And the brighter that day shines, the worse things are right now. There are probably some traumas that can only be healed by the constant and eternal presence of God. Will earthquakes happen in heaven? Some people say there won't be and that nature will fix itself and no longer need tectonics. Others say that there will be earthquakes, but that people will no longer be vulnerable to and harmed by them. Either way, it will not be a ghostly, floaty existence somewhere in the clouds. The Bible speaks of a future reality that is not only supernatural, but also every bit as natural as the one we currently inhabit. Christians don't believe they will go to heaven, but that heaven will come to earth, and that the suffering caused by natural disasters will come to a decisive end. If that's true, we can all have hope, especially the people of Turkey and Syria. That's all for the video today. We will be right back with more, so don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thanks for watching.